In this episode of the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast, I'm going to share my thoughts on French wing Zachary Risache, who has been getting a lot of buzz as a potential number one pick in the 2024 NBA Draft. So in this episode, I'm going to make a case for Zachary Risache to be the first player selected in June's draft. Stay tuned. Big, big shout out to each and every single person that has made the Lock On NBA Big Board Podcast your first listen of the day. Whether it's your first, your second, or your third, I appreciate each and every listen. And if you're not subscribed, please subscribe. I want you to like, I want you to share, I want you to leave your comments, good or bad, because feedback is the best way to communicate with all the listeners and the people that are subscribed. So like, share, comment. Also, click the bell so you can get notifications because the Locked On NBA Big Board crew is here to bring you draft content five days per week. Not only five days per week. We do over 250, I'd say about 200 and between 200 and 250 podcasts a year. 200 and 250 draft podcasts a year. I'm probably on about 95% of them. It can get challenging from time to time, but I want to be your source for NBA draft content because right now draft season is around the corner. It is February 27th. The draft is June 26th and 27th. So we're we're doing a two-day draft this year and the prospects that I'll be covering in this particular series, unless something like, crazy happens will not be second day draft picks. I mean, something crazy would have to happen for for Alex Sarr, Nikola Topic, Zachary Risache to fall on the second day. But I said all that to say this. Draft time is not too far away. We got March Madness coming up. I mean, March is like three days away. And then you got your conference tournaments. Then you have your NCAA tournament. You got the Final Four coming up, which is in Phoenix, which I'm thinking about going to. But the Final Four happens to be the same days as the Adidas Next Generation tournament that is in Paris. They end up switching the days. And I am a big fan of the Adidas Next Generation tournament. And that's actually where I saw Zachary Risache play. It wasn't the first time I saw him play, but I saw him two years ago. That was my first time seeing Nikola Topic there. So I am headed to those tournaments, or I plan to head to at least two of the four so I can get a glimpse of some of the international prospects that will be in the 2026 NBA Draft. So I'm already preparing for, for 2026. But anyway, I want to let you know that this episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is the easiest and the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA. It has to be in lowercase. L O C K E D O N N B A, all lowercase, and you can get a first deposit match up to 100 bucks. All right, let's talk about Zachary Risache. Now, I'll give you a little bit of background about Risache, and if you are an everydayer, bear with me. I've told this story before. My first time watching Zachary Risache play was in November of 2021. I. I had got married in Paris. We got married, like, me and my wife got married, like, super early in the morning, like, 6 o'clock in the morning. And we we got married at the Eiffel Tower. So at the Eiffel Tower, in order for you to get, like, really good wedding pictures, you need to do it super early or else you're going to have a gazillion tourists in the background in the picture. So we got married early. And then by 5 o'clock, I, I wanted to go watch basketball. Shout out to my wife. She understood it. She wasn't upset or anything like that. And if anything, she just wanted to sleep because, you know, we had the long flight. She had to get up early. She's probably up super early trying to, like, get her hair done and all that. So anyway, I decided, you know, I'm going to go watch basketball. So I went to go watch a a basketball game. And it was like an Espars League, which is the under-21 league. And that was my first time seeing Zachary Risa I was so high on him in this particular game that I did a podcast with him. I think if you go back and look, it's probably like, I don't know, like November 7th, 2021. And I'm like, this guy is going to be that dude. He's going to be the next 
French star after Victor Wimbayama. So later on that day, I went to watch Wimbayama play against Paris Basket. So in one day, I was able to see Zachary Reese play and Victor Wimbayama on the same day on my wedding day back in 2021. So I left that tournament really high on Reese Shea. I thought like, again, this guy is going to be the next great French star. It was a blowout win, but I saw like athleticism. I just saw like the length and positional size and he was defending all over the floor and the passing. And again, I just knew he was going to be that dude. Fast forward a few months later, I watched him play at this Adidas Next Generation tournament. And I began to like really, really sour on Risa Shag. I saw like a guy that had all the physical tools to dominate and be the best player on the floor. But I just didn't see like the aggressiveness, assertiveness. I didn't see him show much shot creativity. And then I just saw games where he just disappeared in a sense. Like he just had very minimal or little impact on the game. So I began to sour on Risa Shag. And just had some concerns and doubts about, not him as an NBA player. I thought he was going to be an NBA player in a first-round pick. But I just kind of had some concerns and doubts about his aggression and assertiveness and how he was going to score. Well, fast forward to this year. I've actually watched him play twice. And I have this long, like, article about my journey overseas as an independent scout. And I'm, I'm almost done with it. But I'll, I'll probably put it out within the next week or so. But I went to watch Risa Shea play in Monaco. If you remember, or if you're an everydayer, I did this episode in Monaco on the beach. And then I did a, another, I saw him play another time in northern France. I've seen him play twice this year. The results are mixed. I think he's had like 14 points in those two games that I saw him play. One was an 11-point game where the majority of the points came in the second half when the game was decided, the other was a four-point game against Monaco, a EuroLeague team. But I began to like kind of turn the corner a little bit. I saw what he can do as the defensive player. I saw like the physical tools. He's now like 6'10", I believe, even though they had him listed at 6'8". I think he's 6'10". And so I'm now I'm starting to, I guess, more so appreciate what he is and what he can be as opposed to what I want him to be. So with all that being said, Zachary Risache is having a really, really good year for Borg. He is a strong candidate to be the first pick of the 2024 NBA draft, and it is directly related to his positional size, his defense, and his scorching hot lights out shooting. He's shooting like 44.6% from three. He's playing on a competitive team against grown men, playing professionals. And he's more than holding his own. He shows some flashes. He's had some some really good games. But you can make a case and say that he is the best 3 and D prospect in this draft. And maybe even the safest player in this draft. Because he has a game that basically complements any player. I feel like complements any star. Where the concern is if he's the number one pick you're not necessarily drafting a number one pick to be a complimentary piece in most years. But I think this year there is an exception and I could see a team selecting Risa Sherry number one, but not expecting him to be like their franchise guy. So I, to me, fit is going to be really, really important. All right. When we return, I, I kind of went on a rant there. When we return, I'm going to talk a little bit about his strengths and what makes him a potential number one pick. And then later on, I'm going to talk about his weaknesses and give an overall summary of his game. And then I'm going to tell you what's in my notes, the scouting notes that I have on Zachary Risache. Stay tuned. All right, let's talk about prize picks. And if you're not familiar, you may ask, Rafael, what is prize picks? All I can say is prize picks is America's number one fantasy sports app. It has over 3 million members. It is the easiest and the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. All you have to do is pick more or less than two to six players, and you're just predicting the stats. You're going against the stats, and all you have to do, pick two to six players. You're not playing against your buddies. You're not playing against some of the sharks or the bots. You're just playing against the stat projections, and you can let the winnings roll in. And it is demon time on prize picks. And with Demon Time, you can now win up to 100 times your money. You heard that right. 100 times your money 
with as little as four correct picks. So you can turn $10 into a thousand bucks. Demons and goblins are the newest and most exciting way to play prize picks. Squares are marked with red demons or green goblins and you get different payouts. You can now win up to 100 times your money with as little as four correct picks. Prize picks is easy, it's very simple to play. You can make and submit your picks in less than 60 seconds. You can get your money out fast, it is easy, and it has an enormous, enormous selection of players and stat types, and that is what makes prize picks the number one daily fantasy sports app that is prizepicks.com slash locked on nba and you have to use the code in lowercase letters and you can get a deposit match up to 100 dollars locked on has launched the first the absolute first ever 24 7 streaming channel on youtube and now it is also available on amazon fire tv and the free tv channels app Locked on Sports Today is here for you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Like, it just doesn't stop all day, every day, covering the top sports stories of the day with our local hosts. And then we have the national shows that cover every league across the board. So find Locked on Sports Today, which is now available on the free Fire TV channels app on Amazon. All right, let's talk about the appeal for Zachary Rieseshek. And the appeal is obviously the positional size. He's 6'10". He has elite shooting capabilities. He is shooting 44.6 behind the arc. He can shoot whether it's on the move, even though he doesn't have a lot of like movement shots, but he is a capable shooter on the move. He's a good ball handler for his size, not creative or crafty, but he can handle the ball at 6'10", which is a weapon. So he's a guy that can grab a rebound, push the ball up court, make decisions. Again, not a crafty or creative ball handler, but he is a good ball handler at 6'10". So when you factor in that he is a jumbo wing that has the size, and I think by the time he fills out, he could be as big as some centers, but he has the size to play the three and the four, and he can handle the ball in straight line drives. I mean, that is a weapon that also just fits the, the modern NBA I don't know if he's going to be a secondary ball handler, but I do think that he is someone down the line as he gets older that you will be comfortable giving him the ball late in shot clocks and being fine with him making the right read or attacking a closeout or knocking an open open jumper. He's a solid slasher. I mean, I think there's room for growth there, but he is a slasher. Like I said, he can attack closeouts in the half court, but it's strictly straight line drives, not a lot of flash as far as like euro steps and, and and doesn't like he's not like Nikola Nikola Topic who knows how to master angles and have soft touch finishes but Risa Shea is a respectable slasher that can make plays at the rim he makes quick decisions he's a good passer not like great but he does make quick decisions I do think that there is tremendous upside for him as a ball mover a 16 ball mover he makes the right reads when I watched him play against Monaco, even though he didn't like have like a great game, and even though like a lot of the passes he made didn't lead to assists, but he was able to make the skip pass. He does have a good feel, and I think that is an advantage from being able to play professionally at such a young age. And then Europeans, in, in their development, there is a heavy, heavy emphasis on passing, which is kind of like, I'm going on a tangent here, kind of like the opposite of what we have in the United States. We focus on a lot of skill development, creating your shot one-on-one, -on -one, being able to score, beat your man, not a lot of passing. And I think a lot of times if a guy is a really good passer in the States, and, and I could be generalizing here, it's very natural. And I've been to like tons of practices where there's high school, AAU, youth practices, and I don't really see a lot of passing. And with that being said, Risa Shea is a guy that you can tell grew up where team play and passing was emphasized. And even though the assist numbers don't always indicate how good of a passer he is, I do think that he is a really, really good ball mover. Has good length. Defense is where I think he's going to be able to contribute just because of his positional size. And he does play with, you know, some effort on the defensive end. He has the tools to defend multiple positions. I've seen him guard Mike James, who was just, 
I mean, a few games away, if not a game away, from being the EuroLeague's all-time leading scorer. And I thought it was a, a, a really tremendous task for an 18-year-old to go out and defend a high-level scoring point guard who was like a foot shorter. And I thought Risa Shea did a really good job of defending Mike James in the game that I went to. So I left this these two games that I saw him play higher on him as a defensive player than offensive player. I still have a little bit of concerns about his offensive game, but I'll I'll get to that in a second. But I just love the way that he uses his length and mobility to contest shots and get rebounds and steals. I think he's going to be an excellent defender. And when you just talk about the outside shooting, the size and the defensive capabilities, you can say that he has one of the highest floors in this draft and that there is, I mean, there is a a pathway for him to have a long NBA career, even if it's just as a complimentary player. What I'm a little torn at is that a guy that projects as a high-end complimentary player, do you feel comfortable taking him as the number one pick? That is what I'm trying to wrap my head around. Now I want to cover his weaknesses. And I, I just feel like he has what it takes to be more than a complimentary player. Whether or not he has the mindset to get there is a totally different subject. And I've mentioned before, like if I were in charge of his development, He's playing one-on-one all summer. I'm going to take what he does well and what he's learned playing in like the team-centric European game, whether it's being a complimentary guy, a ball mover, an outside shooter, and a cutter. I would like to mix that and combine that to what we do well in America, which is teach guys how to get buckets and score in isolation and create. That's the area that he's missing the most is offensive creativity Doesn't have a lot of reps on ball to showcase what he can do. But in the games that I've watched, whether it's live and on film, I I see that he kind of struggles if he's put in a position where at the end of the shot clock, he needs to create offense for himself or others. So to me, that is a weakness, offensive creativity. Good ball handler, but not a lot of craft. I love to see him add, whether it's some step backs or just mid post I would love to just see him play one-on-one all summer add that to his game because if you put it all together a 40 percent shooter that can attack closeouts that can like take advantage of mismatches whether it's on the mid post the elbow the low post or create off the dribble you have a complete player especially when you factor in what he does well on the defensive end now another and this is kind of a concern Well, he's shooting 44% from three. He's not a particularly good foul shooter. He's shooting below 70% from the line. And so earlier in the season, I was trying to figure out, all right, can he sustain the shooting? And if he can sustain it, which is the better indicator of where he's at? Is it the high shooting from three? Because at one point, he's like at 48%. Or is it the somewhat average free throw shooting? And so far, he's still been hot from three, but he's still been average from the foul line. So... I'm kind of having a a hard time trying to figure out which is the true indicator. Now, he doesn't get to the foul line an incredibly amount of times because he's not like this super aggressive paint finisher or or creative scorer. So the the free throw attempts aren't crazy high. So that could be something that, that, um, you know, is a reason why maybe just not enough attempts. But then again, you can say the fewer attempts, the more he makes. Anyway, another area of concern is that even though I think he has a really high floor, I have some concerns about his ceiling. What can the ceiling be? Now, if he puts it all together, I think his ceiling can be high. I have my doubts about the offensive creativity, but I do think that his I do think he has a high floor. Like like I said that. But I have some concerns about if he's going to maximize his potential. Now, I want to talk about the passing a little bit more, even though he's shown flash of being a good passer and a ball mover. He doesn't have a lot of on-ball reps, so his assist-to-turnover ratio is underwater. I would like to see that improve. And then the biggest, biggest, biggest concern for Zachary Riesenshe, for me, is that he has a tendency to disappear from big games. He's had games where I've seen him play, where it was a championship game, whether it's the Adidas Next Generation tournament, he scored less than 10 points. 
had a game, and I think it was a – it wasn't a gold medal game, but it was one of the final games against Spain this summer. Had two points. So I do have some concerns, and it's similar to Alex Starr, and I don't want to make it seem like I'm picking on French guys, but I do think that there there is a – a tendency or a track record of of the motor and the energy and the effort coming and going and not necessarily having like this alpha dog mentality that I think could help maximize his tools. All right, when we return in the last segment, I just want to share a little bit about Zachary Reese's overall scouting profile, in my opinion, why I think he has a chance to be the number one pick, and I'll share some more of his strengths and weaknesses. Stay tuned. All right, the next segment is brought to you by BetterHelp. Because sometimes we need the opportunity to get some stuff off our chest, whether it's big or small. There are certain things that can really start to bother you or, or get to you. And it's very important for you to get that out. Get it out your system, especially to someone who is unbiased in your life. So today I want to talk about how I feel about something. And, and you might even be thinking about the same thing this week. For me... I want to say what I'm going through, but one of my challenges is that I am a new father. I have a 19-month-old son, and I have a podcast that does about 200 episodes a year, and I have a newsletter that goes out to NBA teams and over 7,000 subscribers. What makes it challenging for me is that during the daytime, while my wife is at work and my son is in school, I am like constantly like working on my podcast, coming up with content for the podcast. Then I need to write my newsletter, but I need the right to make it engaging. But then in the evenings when my wife comes home from work, I want to spend time with my wife and my son because obviously I want to keep my family intact. But then that is when all the games are going on. And that is when I have to watch basketball. I have to know what I'm talking about. For me, it can be challenging trying to balance out this job that I absolutely love in career. In reality, I mean, the person I can talk to is my wife or, or friends and family, but there's not really anybody that I know that has the same exact schedule. There are people that I know that face the same challenges, but that's why better help can come in and, and basically be a great sounding board. And therapy can be different for everyone. Most of us have bigger problems than our favorite sports team, even though there's some really, really passionate fans and and the, um, the wins and losses take a toll on their life. And maybe that's why BetterHelp can be there for you. If you are thinking about starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try because it is entirely online and it is designed to be flexible and suited to your schedule. So visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedOnNBA to get 10% off your first month. That is better, H-E-L-P dot com slash locked on NBA to get 10% off your first month. All right, last segment. I'm just going to share with you some of the notes that I have in my in my phone from watching Zachary Reese live. He has an excellent combination of size and skills. He can dribble, shoot, and pass at a high level. Now, when I say dribble, shoot, and pass, I'm talking about all three. I don't think that the dribbling and the passing is high level individually, but when you combine all three and the fact that he's 6'10", that is a, a rare combination. I put that he's a good ball handler and passer. He does have natural feel as a playmaker. He's comfortable scoring on the move. He can shoot over the top of smaller defenders. He can attack closeouts with his long strides. There is some upside as a pull-up shooter, simply because, like I said, at 6'10", he does have the ability to shoot over smaller defenders. Now, like I mentioned, if he gets the handle and the creativity that allows him to get to his spots, watch out. He could be really, really good. I also put in my notes, and this is based off of his performance against Monaco, was that even though he's he's thin, he's not incredibly thin, but he definitely needs to get stronger. He did exhibit some toughness, whether it was boxing out for rebounds, whether it was picking up Mike James full court, whether it was fighting through screens. I did see that it was a positive sign that he exhibited some toughness because, like I mentioned in the last segment, I thought there was a track record of disappearing and kind of shying away from contact and maybe even been a little bit afraid of the big moment. But in this particular game against a EuroLeague team, I thought that he did display some toughness. Similar to Alex Saar to where 
you know, maybe it was just a change of scenery. Like Sar needed to go to Perth to unlock, you know, some things. And then maybe JL Borg was the perfect opportunity for Zachary Reese Shang to unlock some of his potential, maybe play with a little bit more freedom, a little bit more confidence. So that was something that I thought was pretty interesting. Talk about his defense, active hands on defense, wants to defend. That is key. Wants to defend, whether it's somebody that's his size or a smaller guard. I think that is very crucial is that you have a guy that likes defense. He wants to play defense. There are a lot of guys that are just chilling on defense. And going back to like Nikola Topic, I don't think Nikola Topic has the physical tools to be the defender as Risa Shea, but we're talking about two guys that have totally different roles. We are concerned about Topic's defense, but we saw him in this high usage role where he created a lot of offense for himself and others. And now we see Risa Shea who is playing really good defense, but we see him in a very reduced role where he's limited to pretty much being a spot-up shooter. So I'm curious to see how his defense would change if he were in a, a higher usage role. But right now, I don't think his his game is built for a high usage role. Back to my notes, he's very fundam- fundamentally sound, does show some flashes of being able to operate as a pick-and-roll ball handler, make some hustle plays, and he's a good cutter. So I talked about it with my brother. Like, my brother's not a fan of the term 3 and D. He thinks you have to bring more than just knocking out open shots in defense because if your shot is not falling, what are you doing? So with that being said, I think that Risa Shea is a good enough cutter to offset if he has a game where the shot isn't falling. So if he can be a cutter, because he's still going to be a threat. The defense is still going to keep an eye on him, and he's going to be high on the scouting report as a guy that you can't leave open. But if he never masters the offensive creativity that I want to see, I still think he can be impactful if he's like this really good intuitive cutter because, you know, like I say, defenses are going to key on his outside shooting, but if he can make them pay by being a good backdoor cutter, then I think that really, like, helps him out. Now I want to talk about, like, the biggest weaknesses And I've touched on it, but it is the offensive creativity off the dribble, the ball handling creativity, and then sometimes with this jumper, he seems to be a little bit off balance if he has to shoot it off the dribble. Off the catch, he's fine. Movement, okay. But when it comes to shooting off the catch, he has a tendency to be a little off balance. Again, I do think that Zachary Riesche has a legitimate chance to be the number one pick in the NBA draft simply because this draft is wide open. Nobody has solidified themselves as the number one pick. And 6'10 snipers who can defend all over the floor are hard to find. A team may not take him number one to be their engine, but I do think he can complement anybody. So if it's the San Antonio Spurs, even though they have a lot of wings and there's some overlapping skill sets, he could be the defender that you pair with Victor that can knock down open shots. If it's the Washington Wizards, another wing defender if it is I, I don't know I mean the Portland Trailblazers the Charlotte Hornets I think that there is a pathway for him to complement the guys that they already have I mean the Spurs have Wimbayama uh, I mean I guess the Wizards don't have their A1 guy because I expect Kuzma to be moved and Jordan Poole I mean he's coming off the bench now I think Portland has their guys that they think would be the alpha, and then Charlotte has their two guys that they want to build around. And I think Risa Shea can fit in and complement all of them. Detroit would be a good fit for for Risa Shea. Now, my biggest concern, I'll wrap it up here. My biggest concern for Risa Shea is fit. I think if he goes to a team where they put him in a high usage role, where there's these expectations of him being the number one pick, I think that could be a really tough situation. But if he goes to Detroit, where they have Cade Cunningham and Jalen Duran and Jaden Ivey, and he is the floor spacer and defender, I think that is perfect for him. Same with Charlotte. If he goes and he's a complimentary player to Brandon Miller and LaMelo Ball, I think that's good. Same with Portland. Same with San Antonio. My biggest concern why I have a hesitancy to take Risa Shea number one is the expectations that come with being a top pick because I don't think he is an engine but in this draft he could be the number one pick and still end up being 
a really good complimentary player that helps one of these poor teams that are in the lottery now turn into a playoff team in the very near future. Well, that wraps up this episode of the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast. I have more cases for you of players or prospects that could be the number one pick in the 2024 NBA draft. Stay tuned. Once again, it's Rafael Barlow, and I am out of here.